Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Spiritus Conversations. Today, we are really excited to kick out season six of our podcast. Um, and today, here with me to get that going is my friend Flavio Zanetti. Flavio, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Dan. How are you? Good. I am doing wonderful, my friend. And we have a very special show here today. Um, Susanna is not going to be able to join us, but she will be back for season six. So don't you worry, um, all you Susanna friends out there. She's taking a well-deserved vacation with her family. But fret not. We have some wonderful friends here today to pick up the conversation and to help us kickstart this new season. Um, we are calling this one No Place for Hate. And for that, we had to bring some big guns. So we want to introduce you to some of our friends um, who we think highly of and who we are really excited to have here on the podcast today. First of all, we want to call our friend, Dr. Vanessa Anceloni. Va Dr. Vanessa, welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Here we are together. Great. Wonderful. And, you know, uh, last but definitely not least, our very own Fred Fred Govea, how are you doing, sir? Very good, my friends. Thanks for having me here with you guys. Good to be here. Awesome. Well, you know, we know that Spiritus Conversation is really a show where we sit down with friends to talk about things under a Spiritus perspective. Right? It's informal, it's unscripted, and we really value everybody's feedback. We really want you to be part of the conversation. So if you are watching us live, please head over to the Spiritus Conversation uh, YouTube channel or the Facebook page so that we can see your comments in real time. Sometimes we get shared to other pages, which is wonderful and we love that. But sometimes those comments don't make their ways back here. So if you want to be part of a conversation, head over to the main page and, and leave your comments in there and we'll get to see you. Um, and at the end of the show, we'll also talk to you a little bit more about the upcoming shows that we have planned because we have a whole schedule set for this for this year, for season six. Um, but here we go. So, you know, we're calling this no place for hate, right, Flavio? This is an important piece uh, that we had been talking about for a while, and we finally uh, were able to dive in. So set the tone for us, Flavio. What do you think that this topic is so it's so, so important for us right now? It is, it is so important because, you know, a lot, a lot of times, or oftentimes we see folks uh, uh, really, you know, uh, giving more, more value or more interest to hate as opposed to love, right? And as you all know, spiritism is all about love. But when we see a lot of the uh, hate messages, when we see a lot of the, uh, the hate sentiments that's out there, can we make sense of them? Can we really understand them through a spiritist lens? Can we look at them, right? And maybe try to make sense through a spiritist lens. And that's what we're trying to do it tonight with this you know, esteemed, you know, a couple of guests here with us. Great. So before we throw them under the, you know, the bus and start asking all <laughs> kinds of opinions, right, of, of, of them, and we're going to try to be polite here a little bit. So maybe we start with uh, with uh, with Fred here. Fred, first of all, congratulations, my friend. You just got married. Indeed. <laughs> oh, look at that. He's showing us a ring. Um, oh, that's right. Congratulations. That's right. That's right. Thank you very, um, so, very much. And how is the house mirrored live in New York City, my friend? It feels great. We're still in a honeymoon phase. It feels great to be able to turn to Roger and call him my husband. And we had a ceremony on Sunday with the sunset overlooking the Hudson River, a small picnic with friends, super spontaneous, casual, and the weather collaborated and we couldn't be happier. It really, the the Psalms has a passage that says, my cup overflows. That's the feeling of my cup overflowing with joy and That's so nice. serene joy. So I'm really happy. Thanks for, thanks for mentioning it. <laughs> yeah. No, did you have that weird moment when you wake up next day? You're like, what? I'm married. I did. <laughs> but then I looked at the person next to me and I said, oh, yeah, I made the right choice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Congratulations to you and Roger, Fred. Thank you. And I believe he's, he's here, by the way, here. Fred. He's here watching. He is. He just made a comment saying good hey. evening. Look at that. There's, there's, there's Roger. Hi, Roger. Congratulations. Hi, Roger. 
Congratulations. Um, whether you know this or not, Roger, we're excited that you've joined the family, the larger Spiritus family. And um, we're gonna po I'm going to apologize for all of us in advance, right? Because I know that at one point in time, <laughs> we are going to drag you Ooh, to some events. Is. We're going to ask you what kind of questions, right? And if you want some funny stories on, um, you know, on Fred later, come 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 talk to us. We'll we'll give you yeah, the, the scoop and Dan are a great cool. resource for that. They're just an infinite fountain of stories that they know. <laughs> we'll take. Don't worry. Don't worry, Roger. We'll take your side. <laughs> Love it. That's what true friends are for. That, that's where we're here. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and Vanessa, let's go over to you too. How are things on your end? I know that you've been very busy as usual. How's life treating you? <laughs> Virginia is doing great. The daughter Virginia is doing great. The husband is doing great. We are surviving the pandemic. That's what I would say, all of us, right? I've never seen such a busy year. So many things happening and yet not going places, but doing so much. And uh, I have to say, every time we talk about, especially the topic we're going to discuss, it's like the world needs so much help right now, now more than ever. For many, the pandemic is going away, but not quite. And the aftermath is really here. It's time really to team up and reach out. Just the suicide rates have escalated to more than 900,000 percent, 900 percent. And it's a whole lot. You talk to people all over the world, and I would say we need to do this. Yeah, mm -hmm. and really spread the love. Well, well said, well said, Vanessa. And that's a perfect segue for us to really dive into our topic, right? Um, setting the tone here for us, I think Vanessa did a beautiful job. We are hopefully all vaccinated or getting ourselves vaccinated and, um, you know, seeing what we hope is going to be the, at least for now, right? Uh, the bettering of those, the world situation when it comes to COVID. Uh, nevertheless, there are a lot of different challenges happening out there in our world too. Let's not, let us, let us not just pretend that COVID is our only challenge, right? We all know that there's a lot of things that we need to make better in this world. And one of them is this really difficult mindset that we have had for a while, where we sometimes think that we are better than other people to such an extent that we begin even to hate on other people, right? This past year has been very emblematic of that. We've had so many different challenges on that front, right? On racial uh, hatred, on gender hatred, right? Gender preference hatred, all kinds of different hatred. We've got, you know, just to briefly recap, obviously we won't talk about it all and we won't have time to do that because there's so much happening, but we've got George Floyd, we got Breonna Taylor, we got Jacob Blake. We got the Atlanta shootings as well, right in the spa, uh, with the you know Asian hatred as well. Uh, we've got political polarization, right? We've got so many difficult things. We had the Capitol piece. We had Brexit. Brexit before that. The truth is, the world's kind of been boiling over for a while, and unfortunately, we've seen this increase, especially in this past years, of people just hating on each other. Um, and that has been really tough. Now, of course, we layer that on top of COVID and everything else that it brings. It has made sometimes our atmosphere very toxic in many different ways. So while some people are glad that we are coming out of COVID and we won't put that behind us, the truth is that many of us are still part of a group that could feel quite a bit of tension and hatred towards it, right? Um, and so I want to set that tone really quickly out there and say that hey, we're happy to be together here, but we recognize that there's a lot of suffering, a lot of pain out there that collectively we need to address, right? So I think we can kind of just start um, um, saying if anybody wants to add to that context, any, any, anything else that you might want to add before we start asking you, what is it that we could do? I, I'd like to ask the first question as I usually do. <laughs> What's why, the why, do, why do we hate? Why do people hate? Can we tackle? Can we tackle that to start off? I'll let Who do you want to throw under first. the bus, Flavio? First, myself. No, I'm just <laughs> I don't know. Anybody. No, I think I think it's important for us to at least to have a conversation 
why is there why is hate still you know uh you know there out there you know why do folks hate is there a an underlining motivation for why people hate well we would say only spiritism could uh, help us understand it because even science is puzzled about it all there are lots of theories in psychology talking about for example uh, systemic uh, racism. I lived in Baltimore for almost two dec, almost two decades. I worked at University of Maryland, where you see a lot of prejudice still. And I have stories and stories that I could tell, and it's shocking to see that we are in the 21st century and we're still seeing that much of a separation of intolerance. So. I, w I would say only spiritism explains because we are not only one life. So basically, previous lives experiences play a role. And there is also what Kardec says in the spirit's book from question 100 onwards. It's the hierarchy of spirits. It's the level of our evolution. But, you know, I want to mention this before I pass the word to Fred or other uh, either one of you. It's, um, I remember Franz de Waal, beautiful study, a beautiful study. He did at uh, Imory University in Atlanta. And it's so interesting because Second World War came and he was really shocked about the, the amount of cruelty, the hatred that really exploded at the time. He wanted to investigate the roots of violence. Of course, he was studying it in primates. But after a decade and a half, he started thinking, oh, well, if this could be genetic, could be hereditary, could it be also learned, and you could see those in primates, can we also have a peace root? a reconciliation build up. And it's so interesting because in this beautiful paper, he showed that <clears throat> primates, they fight, even like couples, they fight and then later they make amends. They kiss each other amongst families when there's a squabble and then the mother calls calls the, the, the daughters who already have their own children, but it, it, it's as if she's lecturing them. So we could tell that in spiritism, we could bring it all together, make sense. It's our roots in the animal kingdom that now we need to readjust. That's why I love the message from the book Living Spring that says real humanity, saying that Christ came to teach us to be really really like to be real humans we're not there yet yeah yeah that's a that's a great point vanessa and i love that because you bring this topic that oftentimes folks um they bring up and it sometimes i feel like the topic falls short because we don't add a spiritual perspective to it and what i'm talking about is like nature versus nurture right this whole concept that that some people believe that either you're born with it or whether you learn it. And I think that we have seen through many different established studies that racism and discrimination really is not a nature thing. It's really a nurture thing. It's learned behavior. It's a nurture, yeah. Mm -hmm. We learn to hate on each other, right? We learn mm -hmm. somehow. We're going to point fingers how right now, right? Because it doesn't really matter. We just have to figure it out. But somehow we learn from somewhere in our families, and those around us, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, right? We learn that that it's okay for us to um, to think that we are superior to other people, right? Or that we should treat people differently. And clearly, our history is full of that. Those examples. They are not just race based. They are gender based. They're all kinds of situations. Basically, whatever there has been a human being, right? that human being has felt superior to another human being, whatever that is. To the point sometimes that we even come to this position of, of 
of otherizing people. Like we, we call them others, right? We, we dehumanize them to make it easier for us to hate on them, right? We had obviously the Holocaust, which was an extreme example of that. But we also had slavery. We have all kinds of things that are big stains in our history. And none of that is natural in the sense of it came from nature. This is all our doing. And I think Vanessa's point is a really great one that, you know, when we add a spiritist perspective or spiritual perspective, we understand the issue in a whole different way, right? Um, but we just want to point that out there because I think at the, at, the, at the crux of this is this nature versus nurture piece. And I think that even physicalist or like materialist science tells us that this is not a natural process. It's, it's a learned thing. We all learn this this hatred. So the question then goes goes back to what Flavia was saying, like, why do we learn that? And where is it? And what can we do to stop that learning, to stop that hatred? I think also there is a question about fear that comes into play because we obviously inherit these conditionings from our families, which are not, uh, which are learned, as you said, and they're based on past traumas from previous generations who were attacked, who were persecuted. And then we begin to otherize, like you said, Danny. And then and when we do that, we do it out of self-defense because we are fearful of the other. And so we take the fear route to protect ourselves. And this gets built in so many layers of our upbringing that it takes a lot of spiritual teachings, a lot of prayer, a lot of meditation, a lot of deep inner work of self-discovery in order to start identifying that we even have those layers and begin to peel them off one by one. And I think when Jesus says, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation, part of, I think, this temptation also means me uh, falling into the temptation of groupthink versus thinking for myself, versus questioning things Critical for myself. Because it's so easy to let groupthink take over. And then I am guided and conditioned by what my country says, my president says, my center says, my neighborhood says, my school, my parents, all of these people in positions of authority that we've, since we were very little, learned to look up to them for guidance as a reference. And then I think in the process of learning spiritism, we start to deconstruct that and begin to look at Jesus as the guide and model only. And it takes a lot of courage to let Jesus be the guide over and first over all of these other things. That's why when he says, let your speech be yes, yes, no, no, that's a very individualist stance that sometimes takes a lot of guts to make. Because you may go against family, you may go against people, but if it's in my heart and in my conscience of what my spirit truly wants to do, then I need to be able to align that, right, inwardly. And I just wanted to say one more thing, because I know this is not a lecture, it's a conversation, then I'll be quiet. But Abraham Lincoln, who I love and I know, we know from studying spiritism, is at the forefront of the spirit guides helping North America progress he has a saying when he was alive which i think is so powerful and serves as a warning sign to where we are today he said since we're all here connected with the spiritist movement in the united states or most of us are at least he says america will never be destroyed from the outside if we falter and lose our freedoms it will be because we have destroyed ourselves and so i guess this to finalize this piece, it's why do we hate? And I think we, we don't accept so many things about ourselves. And rather than shining a light in it and doing the dirty, painful work of examining it so that I can learn to accept it, I then project outward. And then by not accepting in me, I look at something similar in others and I begin to attack, right? So. Yeah, I love that, Fred, because I think that for me, you know, uh, at the core of, of hate is, in, in, is insecurity, right? Um, like for you to hate other people, you have to be pretty insecure about who you are, 
It might not happen consciously, right? But you feel like somebody else is a threat to you, or you feel like you're going to feel better. You, you feel like you're going to be feel better if you put somebody else down, right? You're still in the mindset of, of you know, for somebody else, uh, for me to succeed, somebody else has to to tank, right? And I love that because what really resonated with me quite a bit, Fred, is your comment of us having to reevaluate the inheritances that we have, right? Whether they are family traditions or habits and so forth. And it's really hard, right? It's really hard breaking away and examining how we were raised um, and what kind of behaviors and attitudes our families or friends or whoever had that perhaps do not suit us anymore, that, you know, they're not healthy for ourselves and for society at large. That's really tough because we have this idea, right? Like that the blood's thicker than anything, that we should do everything for our family, right? right. And that we, and then in doing that, we forget that there's a larger family here at play. And so we, we pick our little tribes because it gives us meaning or so we think, right? And then in the process, we hurt other people. And that's a lot of people out there that's getting hurt, right? And so, yeah. but, but I cut you off, Flavio. So go ahead and say something really smart. <laughs> that's going to be difficult, but I'll try anyways. All right. So, so the show is over then. Okay, let's go back. So, all right. Thank you for joining. I'm just kidding. So I think, uh, I think we've, uh, we've touched on a lot of good topics, right? So nature versus, you know, nurture. What's the, uh, the root cause of hatred? Uh, why do we hate? You know, uh, sometimes it's because it's, a, I mean, it, most often it's a learned behavior. But what, it, what do we need to do? To use spiritism to break away from that learning. Or more so, when we go study spiritism, one of the things that we learn from Kardec, right, and all the uh, benefactor spirits that have written things after him, we have to think critically. We, spiritism has to make sense logically for us to put that into practice. How do we, right, disembark from that circle that we keep doing the same things over and over again and look for things more holistically? Maybe through the eyes or through the lens of reincarnation. Because guess what? If we hate that group of people, there are some chances we'll be back incarnated in that group of people. How do we make sense of that? Yeah, you're bringing out the big R, right? Reincarnation. <laughs> Like once we bring out the big R, everything changes, right? Here we are protecting our families or our nations or our status or what we think is our race, right? Which, by the way, race is a really funny construct because yeah. when you look at, you know, genetics, you see that, you know, what goes genetically under the skin tone, right? Or your ethnicity is completely different than what you would ever imagine. That's a great conversation for some other time, perhaps. But the big R changes everything, right, Flavio? It changes everything. We, when we think about that spiritist perspective or the spiritual perspective, oh my goodness, um, we never, we we can never be the same. If I, if I'm coming back, right? Like, and and I get this, right? I get the, I call it the YOLO argument, right? If you only live once, people that, if you're in the YOLO mindset and you're saying, you know, YOLO, and then I get why you step on people and why you hate on people, or selfishly, and all that, yeah, sort of. I sort of get it. But once you start thinking spiritually and you think that you're more than your physical body, that's a tough argument to swallow, right? And then when you put reincarnation on top of it, oh my goodness, there's absolutely zero reason whatsoever to be for us to have any kind of discriminatory behavior towards anyone for that very reason that you said, right, Flavio? Today, I might be male and Latin. Tomorrow, I might be female and black. The next day, right, the next incarnation, I might be Hindu, right? And the one before that, Catholic. So all those labels that we put ourselves on our identity, they make very little sense when we begin to look spiritually as well. Um, and that's a, that's a game changer. It is. And I would, I would say this, Daniel, a word that you love, education. That's where education changes everything. That's the reason why we reincarnate. Because we need to learn something new, acquire new habits. But the problem is we are reborn and we're distracted again very easily, especially nowadays because childhood is like it's people think, parents think that they have to entertain their children. They say, what do I do to entertain? No, you're not a clown. You're not an entertainer. You're a parent. And a parent is not supposed to 
to prepare your child for the world being an entertainer. And that's where things change. And just to give a reference on how things come from conditionings, many lives. Andrea Lewis, in all his books, shows to us the power of old conditionings. And, and if there's one book that would clarify it all, and forgive me, I'm going to change the author, Emmanuel, in the book 2,000 years ago, when Aurelia, the girl, comes to this psychic and he reveals lives before, showing to her that she has been in the same old habit with this one person, this couple, plus her own sexuality. So interesting. And then we go to the book, Amalia Domingo Soler's book, Reincarnation Life, which is originally in Spanish, Hechos que Prueban. I love that book. We started at Kardec Radio many years ago, so you can go to the playlist on either platform, any platform, from Facebook to YouTube, SoundCloud, and you're going to see 15 cases of previous lives. In that book, there are so many cases talking about this reincarnation, as you said, Daniel. And what is shocking is that sometimes our societal conventions, like what is allowed, reinforces our prejudices. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to overcome them in this life, and we don't. That's why education is the only solution. If we, and education is not only the parents' school system. If we don't change our school system, you are in the school system. I go in, in with children, teenagers, and I say, Mama Mia, if we don't change it, we won't change anything. You know, it's not only the parents. Beautifully said, Vanessa, you know, because as you were talking about it, and we are talking about reincarnation as a liberating mindset, right? You know, truth is, like when there's people involved, everything gets corrupted a little bit, right? Um, if you think about it, if you look at the, the caste system that we have sometimes in Hinduism, reincarnation has actually been used to, to worsen the status quo, right? And to basically determine that, you know, oh, you're born this way, that's because you are less than or you're not worthy. Um, and so, so it's important for us to clarify and go to, those, to, the, to, the, to the beautiful meaning that uh, the words of Vanessa just shared with us, that that's the essence of reincarnation. It's not something that's meant to put you on rails and say, this is only what you can do because you were born in this caste system, right? Or that you are only born here because you are meant to suffer. Not at all. Like, you know, if we don't break those, those, those cycles through education that Vanessa so beautifully said and what Flavio alluded to in the beginning as well, if we are, and Fred also talked about reevaluating concepts, right? If we don't have the courage to step into our own selves and reevaluate how we grew up and how we think and why we think the way we do, we're not gonna be doing a lot of favors for ourselves or the world around us. And it takes a lot of courage to go back and look at those things that sometimes are part of our identity, right? Sometimes we think that who we are, those things, and if you think those things away, then who am I? Right. The truth is you're way more than that. You're an immortal spirit. Right. If one little facet of your identity crumbles, you do not crumble. Right. You remain who you are. And, and, and the education piece that Vanessa spoke about is is a beautiful thing because I really heard her invite us to go beyond education of school systems, what we call sometimes instruction. Right. I think that there's moral education. Kardec brings this beautifully. Right. There's a difference between instruction and education. Education speaks to values, to morals, and to um, everything else. Now, instruction is just learning of content. It's very beautiful and very needed, and it falls short of what we are really here to, to be right, and do, right? But then you may interrupt and say, when you're talking about uh, society and the things, it's like the conveniences. Because people keep repeating the patterns because it's convenient. I remember this, this case that Amalia Domingo Stolner shared with us of this mother of, you know, high society, and she had a son. And he fell in love with a girl of another, you know, social level, socioeconomic level. She said to him, it's okay, you can date her as long as you want, but when you're gonna get married, I'll tell you. 
and you're going to get married too. And the couple didn't fight. They didn't fight the mom. They even the, the the girl said, "It's okay. I feel like I don't need to be married to your body because we feel I feel like the connection is here." So one day, the mother found the proper bride. She thought they split it. They kept corresponding by letter, and then later, when the girl, now a woman, is about to die, she writes the man a letter and says, can you please just come and see me before I die? And he goes. She dies in his arms. When he's back, the mom dies. And Amala Domingo Solar is like, what in the world is happening here? Uh, there must be something. Yeah, and the, the spirit mentor says, yes, 150 years ago. These two were a couple. They were married, but they were from, you know, they were rich, they were wealthy, they had a daughter. But the daughter fell in love with a musician, Fred, at a time when musicians, you know, <laughs> they, they couldn't make a living. It's completely different nowadays. Yeah. But back then, it was another story. And what did the parents do? They not only said no, but they exiled the boy. Like, oh, wow. far away, he died. He didn't like it. And when everybody died and the reincarnation was planned, who, who is who in the story? That's when you said it all, Daniel. You change, you know? The so the guy who was exiled is reincarnated as the mom in his life. And the man, the father who didn't want the daughter to be with the musician, now he's the son of the man he exiled. Wow. But this man is now the mom. So what is the plan for this reincarnation? Reconciliation, forgiveness, love. But when the man who was exiled, now the mom is supposed to forgive, what does he do? He didn't forgive. And he used the convention at the time. Oh no, I can do arranged marriages. Of course, it's too, I love my son. He doesn't know if he, she really loved him would she have done the same? So here's when we give excuses and to support these underlying feelings that we have. And she avenged, the spirit avenged the couple. But the couple, actually, they really rose above. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that because I think that it's the challenge of our times. And we'll see that in the gospels explained by Spiritism as well. This distinction between right and wrong, not just right and wrong, about being what's comfortable, right? Yeah. And what is right. And I, I do love to make this distinction because I think it's the one that I've encountered in my life quite a bit. Like we do things out of comfort or conviction, right? And most of the time we do it out of conviction or out of comfort like when it's mm -hmm. saying hey it's just so much easier to go with it to go with the way things are right and so as we think about how do how do we change that that requires personal change which goes back to what we were talking about right it requires us sitting down and saying all right i am willing to go into that deep space within myself and really think about why am i here spiritism can help us understand that right and what am i going to do moving forward which spiritism can also help, but it's really about a lot of others. What are what are we going to do? And that is a really hard thing because looking, like we resist looking inside. It's so much easier to look outside, right? I mean, even socially, right now we are having a big pushback on the whole critical race theory. I don't know if you guys heard about this, but the idea behind it is very simple. Let's look at our systems to establish ways in which we have behaved together. And let's see how they are biased or what kind of bias or systemic bias and prejudices might be in there and i transfer that to ourselves too right sometimes we too have our systemic prejudices and biases like we don't even know that's in our system sometimes we discriminate each other without realizing that we're doing it because it's so ingrained it was so normal we learned it that way we don't even think about it right and so yes i'm a big believer in system thinking but systems are made of people so what is it that you can do what are we going to do flavio but but then I mean, you make a good point, right? So so people usually, if you ask, you know, 
most folks, are you racist? Do you discriminate? Folks will say no. Oh, no, I'm not racist. I don't discriminate. But if we know, we understand based on data that our systems discriminate still. Our system is a racist system everywhere across the board, right? Based on data, racism or discrimination is in the air that we breathe. Therefore, we fall from the same you know, shortcomings. I think I, I love how spiritism is pragmatic, right? At least for me, I love the way, the, you know, the, the idea that spiritism brings us, right? It invites us to think differently. It invites us to make the longest journey a human being can ever make, which is from here to our hearts, right? And we forget to do this because we're so busy getting, you know, making money, getting work done or doing this and doing that. And we forget about that. We forget about the connection we have with people, right? People that are different are oftentimes different than us. And that di those differences, sometimes they're not very well, you know, understood by ourselves. Yeah. Somebody mentioned, I think it was you, Fred, they mentioned people usually hate because they don't understand. I think it, it yes, I think it's one of the huge, one of the reasons. We don't understand the others that are different than us. Therefore, they might not be nice. You know, therefore, they, they don't belong here. But how can spiritism yeah, yeah, yeah. break that cycle and open our minds to understand humanity as God created all of us, the same yeah. equal. I think conceptually there's one thing I learned from Spiritism and uh, the uh, scholar Carlos Torres Pastorino reinforces that a lot in all of his books. Unfortunately, they're not yet available in English, but the, the Brazilian Spiritist Federation has purchased, I, I understand, most of his books. So hopefully in the future we'll see some of those titles in English, but he makes a very clear distinction between personality versus individuality. And regarding beliefs and what am I attached to, if I believe all the aspects of my personality define who I am versus my individuality, which is the immortal spirit before that, transcends that above all of that, that's who I truly am. But if I only understand that there is an existence of a personality and I ascribe all my beliefs and I attach all my emotions just to this transitory personality, then there is no room but to hate, but to have prejudices, but to have preconceived ideas, because this is only if I, if I truly believe all of these labels define who I truly am as a spirit, then there's no room left, right? But if I take a step back and I see that above my personality, even my transitory personality of many reincarnations, like Dan said, as a Hindu, as a Catholic, as a black woman, all of these define personalities that my spirit uh, animated, right? But if I'm able to see a threat above this, that this is who I truly am, then I get to a realization that not even the struggles that I go through define me. So if I'm poor, if I'm going through struggles of addictions, those struggles don't define who I am. When then, if I'm able to get to that realization, then I take a step back and I'm, I'm able to then stay at peace within my spirit and be able to look and say, okay, I'm going through this transitory struggle to learn something, to expiate something from Vanessa's example of the, the reincarnation, expiatory reincarnation of the, the, these people to have to reconcile they still don't define who those spirits are, right? They're, they, they are above that. They are above not in the sense of better or, or worse, but they're just, they transcend that. So I think part of the educational process of the world and of our children, and we, here we are with three of you guys who are parents, which I truly admire, which is, is an experience that is full with so much wisdom and everyday learning opportunities, is to see that, the new groups of children and the new generations that are reincarnating, they're bringing ever more wisdom and they are challenging ever more strongly the conventions of society, the preconceived notions that we've been bringing out of comfort, not conviction, out of comfort. And it's, it's a struggle, I think. It's a big challenge for parents to be able to... Uh, still exert their authority and not be entertainers like Vanessa to be able to educate, but to be able to uh, have the, the balance that is between shaking the foundations of the upbringing so that the children can really express who they are, their spirits, right? 
versus being able to guide their growth. So and here's to us not messing it up, right, Fred? As parents, right? <laughs> cheers let's, to that. Not, hopefully, yeah. Cheers to, let's, cheers, cheers to us. All, all parents reading, right? Our, our kids don't come with manuals, so it's it's tough yeah. to you know to read them. You know, it, it, it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. No, but that's that's a, a great point. You know, and as you were talking about that, Fred, I I am reminded about a very practical piece of advice that touched me when I heard it. Um, it came from Brian Stevenson, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. You guys might have seen it. And he has a TED Talk and a book and so forth. And he's, he says, like, get proximate. What does it mean? Like, get near people. Get close. Right? Get close to, to people who are different than you so that you can feel your pain, their pain. You can empathize with them. Right. Because if we remain distance, whether geographically or emotionally right, or spiritually from other people, it is harder for our little hearts to really comprehend what it is to be somebody else or to be in those shoes. But if I get to know people that I think perhaps are different than me, that perhaps I hold a bias against, if I get to know them in a more personal way, then I am sure that my positions might change because I will, first of all, humanize those people. I will understand that they're humans, right? They're not just um, somebody with a gender and ethnicity or sexual preference or whatever it is. They're humans who go, let's go back to Shakespeare, right? The whole idea of like, if you uh, prick me, do I not bleed, right? right? So all of us feel pain. All of us feel that, feel that the anguish and the challenges, all of us are undergoing some sort of burden or challenge that nobody knows about, right? So if I get close to the person or to the to the people quote, quote I'm doing air quotes here right that I find uh, that might be different than I am maybe I get to learn something about their lives that will help me break these systemic prejudices that we might even have been maybe we even bringing those for many lifetimes right like maybe mm -hmm. we've had this mindset of discrimination and racism within our own individual hearts and we've been carried this for many lifetimes because it takes a while for us to break those habits if we don't work on them. So getting proximate, it might be a way for us to, to begin that journey process. And if we have the spiritual awareness that you're talking about, Fred and Vanessa and Flavio, how wonderful would it be to layer that on top of, of that experience, right? But we've got to get close to each other. If we are just distant from each other, we're not going to get anywhere. And, and, and Daniel, when you're saying that, people may even ask, like, but and yet people are close and they're still hating each other mm -hmm. why so here is where there's another element especially now in the pandemic we would like to share um studying some of the latest books by manuel Filomen de miranda especially the latest ones and the, the latest is about the pandemic uh, no mundo, no rumo do mundo de regeneração. On the way, however we want to translate, on the way to, to the world of regeneration. And what is interesting here is that Manuel Flamengo de Miranda, the third author, talks about pandemic. And, and he talks about this collective obsession that happens. And I, as a psychologist and neuroscientist, I recognize some elements when we say uh, there is what we call emotional contagion. It's when people start feeling something when you talk about what happened in the, the capital recently, this year. Said, so what was in people's minds? What, what, what was happening there? It's this collective obsession. And it's beyond being political. It's about the, the social, emotional behavior here. So here we call psychiatry to talk about the, the psychopathy aspect of it all. There is a point in which it's not only, oh, a conditioning of the past. There is a collective yes. push when yeah. we're also collectively being, either we overcome it now, which is clear, we have to, there's no time anymore or else, or else. Yeah. So yeah. we need to get that in mind that every thought and feeling creates associations, as Andrea Luis says. It's the law of the mental field. And once we create that association, we will receive the impact of it. 
So we have to pay very close attention. Some people, as you know, they go through social media and they say, I'm just reading, I'm just watching. And Andrea Lewis is going to say in the book, Mechanisms of Mediumship, he's going to say, be careful. You, if this is an inducting agent. It's going to trigger in you a connection. And then without noticing, boom, you're in the abyss of it all. When you realize. Yes. And as it, it, bring, it brings some a diet of the mind. Yeah. yeah, it brings some amazing points. And, and with my, my mind's going, and I'm sure some folks that are going to listen to us later on in our life may be thinking, with all these situations that we see in the media today, right, where hatred generates a lot more clicks than love. We all know that. We turn on the news, right, you know, disasters and all this. They generate a lot more, a lot more you know, uh, uh, views than a love story and whatnot. Do you know or do you think that the world's getting worse or, you know, or not? Definitely Just because not. Oh, Flavio. Oh, Flavio, we had a whole different podcast episode on that already. I know. You're so <laughs> late to the game. Uh, but I, I love that question. I love that. I think Just I, to confirm, I, I, no, the world is yeah. not real. There you are. <laughs> no, say it again. Say it again, no. Vanessa, so everybody can hear it loud no. and clear. No, the world is getting better, especially oh, yes. with the vaccine. <laughs> Yes, yeah, we just true. we just need to deal with the with the stuff with the dirty laundry that we have created, right? It gets to a point that we can't just brush that under the carpet anymore. If we want to get better, we have to expose it, and that's what's happening right now, spiritually yeah. speaking. We are being forced to deal with our dirty laundry with the stuff that we brushed under the carpet. For us to move forward, brushing it under the carpet is not enough. We need to address it, and we are being called to address it here and now. And, and Vanessa brought the, it. Go ahead. Sorry, Dan. I, when I wanted to uh, compliment what Vanessa said regarding the emotional contagion, there's a passage in the gospel that Jesus says, woe to the world because of scandals and woe to those through whom the scandal comes. And comes. And, but there's a part that maybe he said, but the evangelist didn't write it down. But I think it goes great with this thought, which is uh, we don't need to become scandalized by the scandals or outraged and that's what's happening because we scroll through the social media we see more hate than love it awakens in us this emotional contagion it triggers makes the link that vanessa says and then we become scandalized by the scandals so the the scandals are not necessary in the world because we need to become scandalized that's not the educational function of the scandals the, the educational function of the scandals, I believe, is to bring everything to the surface so that everything that is hidden can come to light so that we can deal with it, so that we can shed light and learn from it and be able to overcome. But becoming yeah. scandalized is not part of what the spirit world wants us <laughs> as a learning process, right? That's a great, that's a great segue for Stephen's question. Thank you for bringing that up. Right. Yeah, and we say hello to our friend Stephen out there in Ireland, um, who, you know, we hope to have him in one future episode here, too. We'll, we'll, we'll coerce him somehow. Um, he won't be able to hide away. But I think that his question is really great because it goes to what um, what Fred was talking about, which is the scandal piece, right? Hey, listen, the scandal like is necessary. The, the bringing up of things is necessary. But how we do it, it's important. Right. Like we can bring difficult topics. We can bring difficult conversations without being in your face, dramatic and forcing people to have a emotional response to it. There are ways in which we can try to the best of our abilities to address things sincerely. So when you know, when Stephen tells how do we how can we be honest? How can we be sincere and not hurt other people's feelings when we are dealing with stuff? That is an amazing and beautiful question, because I think that's sort of like what we're here to learn. Right. Um, but when he once it comes from a sincere place, when you're really trying to make an improvement, maybe you preface it. Right. Hey, I don't know much about this, um, but I would like to ask a question. And here's what I observed. And I would like to, your input. Right. There are different ways instead of saying like, oh, you suck straight away. Right. So there are ways of us taking an approach that is a little bit more cautious, that allows us to really heartfeltly address questions that we disagree with because guess what we do disagree on things and that's okay 
That's okay. It's okay yeah. to disagree. To disagree. What's not okay is for us to become like you know enemies over it stuff that we disagree. That's silly, right? Um, like we can think differently and still hang out, right? I have my universal example of ice cream, which is perhaps the best example ever created in the this history of the world. Maybe not, but I really like ice cream. My point is, <laughs> you know, you might not like you might not like strawberry. I love it, right? Ice cream, right? You might like chocolate, right? I like vanilla. Like we can still go eat ice cream together. Uh, and have different flavors. That's very okay. We don't all have to eat strawberry ice cream, right? And um, you know, that kind of stuff. So, so there are different things that we can do. There are different thinking processes that we can have that help us get there. But I also know that we're coming in an hour here, and I guess we could be talking for a, a, a while. But I love this idea that we talked about um, education of morals of the soul. We talked about the role that incarnation has in readdressing our mindsets and really helping us understand that we're not here for one journey. We're here for many journeys, so we better act like it, right? And because even like in the selfish perspective, if you really want to set yourself up for success, right, spiritually speaking, be kind to each other because you don't know who you're going to be tomorrow, right? So if, well even said. if you if you want to be a spiritually selfish, right, uh, be spiritually selfish in a way that benefits everybody, right? Be kind to everybody, right, because that's going to be good for you. And so... We talked about reincarnation. We talked about the importance of, of, of addressing our unmet or unrealized potential through the reevaluation of our habits. Vanessa gave us some examples of stories about reincarnation that really kind of, right, uh, that, that connect the dots for us. And we have some books in there as well that we can kind of um, talk about it in general that, that in there but what are some of the parting thoughts that we can have so so why don't we do our traditional wrap up here where we give each other uh, a couple of like a quick minute to talk about it and then we can talk about what else is happening out there in the world before we, we sail into the sunset um does that make sense yep so um fred can we go to you what what do you sure. take away from today well i'm honestly i'm grappling with steven's question uh the thought is in my mind and i feel like i want to share before we go how to be honest sincere not hurt the feelings of the other person i think we have to remember the, the only thing i can control is my own feelings and emotions i have no control over the other persons and if they're going to get hurt or not jesus hurt people's feelings that wasn't his intention but the scribes, the Pharisees, the doctors of the law were hurt by a lot of things that Jesus did because they didn't understand. They felt hurt. Now, that wasn't Jesus' intention. Jesus came to bring the truth, but they still felt hurt, right? So uh, I think for us, bringing it to me, I feel hurt when this happens. I felt this, um, uh, I felt this um, you know, that you didn't take into, con I, I felt like I wasn't taking into consideration in that uh, exchange. I felt like I was underrepresented. I felt like I was tossed aside. If I can bring it to me and my feelings, how I felt when I'm talking to the person, that's something I can control and I can honestly share. So it, it, you can share from a place of vulnerability, hum humility, and hopefully there's more empathy in the dialogue and hopefully less of a chance that the other person is going to feel hurt, right? I guess that's the parting thought. Not that I know how to do this because I struggle with this every day because the immediate reaction is to point the finger. But if I'm able to give a, a pause of vigilance between my thought and what comes out of my mouth or comes out of my fingers as I type a response and it directs back to my feelings, hopefully there's less of a chance to cause hurt. Good point. Well said, Mr. Fred. Welcome to the human race none of us know how to do this stuff just right yet right but you know at least we're calling it out we're, we're at least we're, we're calling out we own it right we own it we don't know we don't know 100 percent of what we're doing but we're trying right um great is so that why we need a model daniel when you say that we just want to bring that? you back because we don't know but god sent us a model if people watch the model as we said at the beginning we won't, won't miss it. And if we miss it, we can try again and again. But we need, it's funny because people say, Jesus is guiding model, he's an inspirator. But how, how often do you think of Jesus every day? Uh, how often do you look at what he's done? How often do you read about what he's done? How can you follow someone, someone that you don't look at? 
that yeah. you don't know anything about. And do it through your own eyes, not through what other people say Jesus exactly. said or said. Right? And feel it. And yeah. feel it. Because yeah. it's all about love at the end of the day. And, and this is what I, I would like, forgive me for jumping in, but when Fred was explaining this, it came to me like this image for mental bodies, a collection of images. We, we think in images, we don't think in words. So every experience we get is like a, it's a picture book in, in, in our mental body that vibrates vivid like holograms. And then when we think about choices, maybe the way I was thinking 10 years ago made me do things. 20 years ago, 100 years ago. But today, when I look back, I see it differently. How do I harmonize those memories and not fall into guilt, for example, which is a big problem for humanity. Many people, they engage into hatred because they also feel guilty and they want to cover it up and feel like I'm not the only one. There are 10,000 reasons why people do it. So we think, we need to harmonize it image by image. It's as if we are Photoshopping it with new, it's like we're editing. We're looking back at those experiences till we become pure spirits. A pure spirit has lived so much, but he harmonized or she or he, however we say it, harmonized those memories inside of us. They didn't disappear. They are there, but now we look back and we see the other cameras of the scenarios inside and then we understand, oh, that's why this happened. I'm not a victim. And that person isn't a victim either. We're in this to learn together. And Andrea Louis says, in the book Evolution into Worlds, we're learning beings. We will learn as long as we make effort and repeat it. It's effort and repetition. Effort and repetition. So we need to practice and practice until we're going to eat it. Yeah. So well guys, this is amazing. Very well said, Vanessa. Uh, uh, but it's at that time that we need to wrap, folks. It's already, you know, 58 minutes past the time that we started. It feels like we just started. And we could go on until, you know, much later because this is an amazing conversation. But it's time for us to wrap. Dan, Fred, and Vanessa. But before we do that, I'd like to thank all of the folks who asked questions, made comments, that followed us live. And those that will be following us later on. And before we depart, Dan, what do we need to do next? Great question. A great question. I just want to also do a little bit of a spoil alert here and tell you that we're actually going to talk about the Jesus question on our episode in December. We're calling that one Follow Christ, Not the Christians. Um, and so that's going to be an interesting piece. But I wanted to touch briefly on the idea that we talked a lot about Jesus today. He's definitely the biggest and best example we've got out there. But he's not the only one, right? And our good spirits tells us that too in the spirits book. If the idea of Chris of Christ is still not sitting squarely with you right now, still because you know maybe you were introduced to a Christ that's slightly different than what Christ was, because maybe you inherited that idea of what a Christ Christ should look like, right? Hold on, hold on in there, and and do some of that that searching that we know you can do. If not, come back in December, and we'll talk more about that stuff as well. Um, but we also wanted to share with you really quickly that uh, in the coming um, months, we're going to have different episodes. So July is no place for hate. August is, is spiritism a religion? September is, what's this mediumship thing? And October is going to be spiritism and spiritualism, brothers from different mothers. And we're going to talk about that as well. And there's more coming. But um, as we begin to wrap up here, we also want to invite you to go back to our website and check past episodes and follow us on Facebook and um, on, on YouTube as well. But we're excited to be able to introduce this idea that we could think about reincarnation as a key part of our um, decision-making model for everything, we do, including fighting, fighting uh, anti-Semitism, anti-racism, right? fighting racism, fighting any kind of ism out there that's not beneficial to us. Because we got to do it, right? Um, and Flavio, what else would you say before we ask our friends how people can get in, get a hold of them? I, I just want to thank everybody. I mean, I know this is a, a very good you know opportunity for us to spend some time together and talk about this, which was a very interesting topic. I know there's more to be talked about this, so I invite you to continue the conversation 
within your own, you know, settings, with your own spiritist centers, folks you talk to, right? Going back to Alan Kardec's, you know, request, spiritism should be pragmatic. We should look at spiritism in order to help us in our daily lives. To Vanessa's point, right? How do we look at Jesus as if he's acting on our, on our behalf right now? What would he do if he was walking on my shoes? Having that pragmatic approach helps us flip us back to the whole learning, you know, mechanism. So again, thank you all for joining, folks. And uh, maybe we need to ex to, to uh, give a little sample of how folks can connect with uh, Vanessa and Fred uh, then. Yeah, yeah. Fred, tell us how people can get a hold of you and what kind of uh, great shenanigans uh, you are involved with these days. <laughs> well, uh, I, the, uh, the spiritual shenanigan I'm involved with since last year during the pandemic is a YouTube channel called Spirit Reflections. That's S-P-I-R-I-T, Spirit Reflections, which is a, a place that I invite people around this fire, mythical fire, for them to share their personal life story, their personal journey, and the spiritual tools that they found along their way, how those tools have helped who they are today and the work that they do. I found that by bringing these people to share their personal struggles, the sharing of that alone inspires a lot of people that are listening and they that build bridges of empathy. And it's been a fun journey and it's on uh, Instagram Spirit Reflections. And we have conversations around the fire on Saturday evenings in Portuguese and on Wednesday evenings in English. The YouTube channel is also called Spirit Reflections and there's a lotus flower there. So uh, I invite you guys to take a look and thank you for being here. Congratulations, Flavio, Dan, on this initiative. Keep up the great work and it's great to be amongst friends here, Vanessa, Flavio, and Dan. Thank you, brother. Great. Yeah, always great to have you, Fred. And Vanessa, let's go over to you. I know that you've got a couple of things there. If I'm not mistaken, the Spirit Society of Virginia just celebrated 10 years. No, Kardec, no, right? no, no, 14. 14, 14 years. That's right. 14. Kardec Radio is wow. 10 years. Is that what it is? Kardec Radio is turning 10. This time. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. So a magazine, lot of exciting things. The magazine just released. Uh, it's the 13th year that we've been working with the Spiritist magazine as well. And uh, there's a group in DC that held that Fred was there the first on the first day five years ago. It's gonna turn so an five amazing years day October as well. Yeah. And uh, you know, people can connect with us in so many ways. All the websites, Spiritist Magazine.org, cardiacradio.com, ssvirginia.org, as spiritismdc.org. I mean, there are so many ways, but Cardiac Radio is probably the easiest one, cardiacradio.gmail.com, where we can connect very easily. And thank you for inviting me to be here. It's great. It's wonderful. No, thank you. Thank you both for putting up with us in our non-orthodox way of perhaps talking about different things. We are really grateful for your expertise, for your presence, for your dedication to, you know, talking about spiritual things, which is all about... Uh, what we try to do here is Spiritist Conversation. Thank you for joining the conversation. We hope that you come back soon to talk with us again. Okay. Thanks, folks. Good evening. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.